Hello, everyone. Welcome to Elevating Your Life. Paula Vale here, and uh, just a fantastic guest today for everyone. I'm so happy to share with you. We have with us today Ed Mitchell. He was a foster child who later graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He went on to be an Airborne Infantry Ranger, a RAND Corporation Fellow, an Aerospace Systems Engineer, and a community activist fighting to protect water resources in California. By weaving his real-world experiences from foxhole to space into his adventure thrillers, Ed became a national award-winning author for Best Fiction, an Amazon number one bestseller, and the bronze winner of the Global Book Awards for self-published historical fiction. As a writer, he is proud of being a charter founding member of the International Thrill Thriller Writers Organization. And Ed, you're just, that is so fantastic. I'm just so honored to have you on the show. And I have to say your, your latest book, The Centurion Witness, I loved it so much. I'm just so excited to share you with the audiences. Uh, well, now, ladies and gentlemen listening, I, I did not pay her to do that. She actually read the book, which I greatly <laughs> I appreciate. Did. And I loved it. Oh, my gosh. It was amazing. And the ending, oh, my gosh. I, I would like to ask you, uh, tell us about this subtitle on your book. What What is that? Um, you know, what prompted you to it's, do um, <clears throat> A tale well, the of subtitle resurrection. Is a tale of Yes. Um, it, it's, um, I got into it because there was this old movie, Ben-Hur, uh, that I saw years ago. It was a blockbuster, and it was an action adventure, but it had this inspiration, uh, religious uh, ending. And uh, that was from the viewpoint of a Jewish family. And, um, but in, in the Bible, there's a place where uh, Jesus says, uh, my God is the God of all peoples in the New Testament, says that. And so I thought it would be uh, good to try to take the story from a Gentile, a, a, a Roman viewpoint, from someone who wasn't in uh, Judaism or in the, in the history of that uh, developing those, those people. And um, turns out that uh, that it, it turned out that it a lot, number of people were responding to it because I filled in a hole. So it, you 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 like practically you read the book. You, you're like walking down the street, and it's it's um, I think very relatable to today's world. So it worked. Yes, it's amazing. It's amazing, and. Uh, what pulled you in and triggered you to, I mean, this being this soldier and what he went through and, and the ending of the book, oh my gosh, it, it was just amazing. What, what prompted you to go that direction? What message were, were you thinking? Well, for one thing, to? being a veteran, I, I have uh, insight into military people, military thinking. Uh, it's not all that different now. The technology is, but when you're in a foreign land and uh, the military people are problem solvers and uh, you deal with what's what you walk into. And so I thought that I had a background that I could communicate this story and 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 from the standpoint of a person who knows that they've sinned badly and and their um regret you know some of us walk around with regrets that we don't tell anybody about but they're there mm -hmm. you wish you hadn't done it and uh, he's in that uh, condition and um and then it was a way to bring out the story of why would Pontius Pilate murder an in innocent man? And so that uh, was a lot of people I talked to. There's there's holes in the Bible. The Bible is not 
uh, uh, every detail. It's just the important details. And so you get these gaps in there and you go, well, well, how did this one guy who shows up in the New Testament uh, goes into uh, Pontius Pilate's office and ask him to bury Jesus? How'd the guy get in the door? I mean, do you go up to the governor of your state and just walk in and go, hi, how you doing? Um, nope. No, you don't. So there mm -hmm. had to be a background and it's not there. It, it, there's other research that brings out that type of a man and and how um, he was involved. And so the the uh, centurion is in this world where um, there's great turmoil and trying to sort it out. Um, and then he he he's a witness to some things and that causes him to start um, taking actions that he had never planned on doing. Yes. That's the short answer. <laughs> yeah. And he really, you know, being in the depth of all that and the, and the choices he made and, and, you know, the, the integrity he showed and how he stood up um, to, to represent good was, was really touching for me. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, let me give you an example. Of one of the holes, um, this uh, Joseph Arimathea is the one that went in and asked uh, to bury Jesus. Well, it turns out that he was one of the richest uh, Jewish merchants in Jerusalem. And uh, he worked with the Romans. Um, he was the minister of mines. And so he was also a judge in their, their what we call Supreme uh, uh, Court, uh, Sanhedrin. Uh, he was one of the 71 judges. And so um, he was in a position that I could use him as a character that would bring information to the reader where you see that, um, that Pontius Pilate was confronted with uh, a very bad problem, a riot near, near riot in his town. And how do you solve it? And um, so um, another place is like uh, talking in the Bible or, or talk research around the Bible where they say, well, uh, Jesus was buried in 108 paces from uh, where the crucifixion occurred. And I, I went and said, no, I don't think so. Because where the Romans were crucifying people was a desecrated ground. And so here you have the richest man in Jerusalem uh, who's trying to follow uh, their rules for burial. I just said, no, he's not going to bury him that close to uh, desecrated land. And he's not going to carry his body. And uh, I mean, he's got workers to do that. So I, I filled it in with some practical stuff about, yes, they got the body and probably put it in a wagon and covered it so the, his mother didn't have to see the gruesomeness um, and then took it to a place that wasn't desecrated. Um, and I think I, from the feedback I'm getting from people and the reviews and everything, um, it's it just practical. They go, yeah, I can see how this could happen. And, uh, and it makes it believable. I think you found it believable yes. uh, that uh, you yeah. didn't find anything in there. You said, oh, no, that couldn't happen. No, no, I didn't. I hope. <laughs> and it just, it just pulled me in. And I felt like, you know, I just felt like what, how it would feel to be there and see this. It, it was just something really greatly. The, the problem with being an author and, and you, I know, know it because you wrote uh, your book, uh, Why Am I So Happy? Uh, which has done very, very well. Uh, in fact, didn't it, didn't you have that uh, it displayed in Times Square? Yeah, I got a display in Times Square. Yes, yes. Oh, oh, <laughs> that's big time. Yeah, that, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. But it, but anyway, as a, as an author, you go on this long journey. For me, it, it's usually a number of years writing a book and the research and everything, and not knowing if it's going to work. And one of my things that I wanted to do, because America is more secular now than it was when the movie Ben-Hur came out, which um, I mentioned before, um, 
I wanted to be able to hook both people who are, are I will say, not believers, they're not a religious based, as well as people uh, that follow uh, religion. They're trying to hook both. And that's a little tricky. Um, and so uh, it had to be entertaining. Uh, so and interesting. And so I worked on that and uh, I believe that it's doing that. In fact, I find that I have a number of people in churches that, that uh, have read it and um, they actually want to see the soft hand of Jesus in the first chapter. And I can understand people that are looking for that, but um, this, this takes you uh, into the world of the soldier first and then the transition that occurs. And uh, so far, um, I, I haven't been yelled at by anybody on either side of the, the issue of belief. And it, it really does take us into the world of a soldier. Uh, it, it, it really, really does. It, it was amazing to read that and feel that and get an idea of what he was going through. It was just, it was a, a, it's a very touching book. It was for me. Well, thank you. Um, one of the things about uh, Judea and, and uh, that area, oh, generally called Palestine in those days, um, was it was actually very small between Galilee and Judea. It, I lived down in uh, central California in, in um, Monterey County and Literally, our county is about as big as Israel is today. So um, it's very small, but if you're walking it as they had to do or riding a horse, uh, it, it took longer to, to get to, from 125 miles from tip to bottom. So um, that helped me get a feel for the uh, perspective of time and movement and uh, difficulty and how long you could be in saddle with a horse and still do your job. Um, and then I had to do it. Now, some people, um, I took some liberties in the sense that I spoke about hours. Um, they did have that terminology, uh, but how they calculated was tricky. And I didn't go into the description of, I, I just said a couple hours or half a day or something like that. But in, they didn't have minutes and watches, but the, the thing about it was uh, it got difficult to write about, well, uh, he turned to the north uh, at noontime and measured his shadow and uh, knew that there were X hours left in the day. Uh, it, so I did get one person who's, who was concerned about it not being... 100% historically correct. And um, so I've got an announcement in, in the ebook that, that explains why I cut through some things to make it more understandable for the reader. That, that, so that makes sense. There's, so there's you, challenge. yeah, you wanted it easier for the reader to understand uh, the process and where it was going. Yeah, I didn't want to write it in in uh, Hebrew or in oh. Aramaic, uh, yeah. you know. So um, I think it comes across where you catch on the idea that uh, twenty hours in uh, riding a horse can make you really tired. Yeah, and that's a day's journey, a long day's journey. It's yeah. like two days journey. Yes, and it's it is. It's just an amazing book, Ed. And um, you've written several books, haven't you? Yeah, I started out, I have a series uh, on counterterrorism, but I started doing counterterrorism study uh, in 1988. This was well before the type of terrorism that's now. It was just coming out. Um, and I was, as a soldier, um, I was going to the Naval Postgraduate School, and I was trying to figure out um, why, how did a Islamic group, how did the leader talk someone into going and committing suicide. American soldiers aren't like that. We, Our whole culture is the officer will step to the front and say, or the NCO, 
and it'll say, follow me. You're not going to, I'm not going to have you do anything that I wouldn't do. And uh, whereas what was going on in the Middle East, um, uh, they were having people just blow themselves up. And the, the Viet Cong didn't even do that. They would drive by on a motorcycle and toss a bomb into uh, a bar or something, and they'd live to fight another day. So in the process of, of trying to figure that out, I uh, concluded that if we, this was 1988, well before the towers went down in the 2001 or uh, 9-11. Um, I said, if we, if America ever sees a, a zealot terrorist from the Middle East, a general who was as good as our generals in picking out a strategic target, that is something that if you can accomplish uh, overcoming that target, it'll drastically affect the outcome of the war. And if he also had the ability to mass material, uh, mini material onto the battlefield. And the third thing was, could he get him tactically trained? I said, if we ever run up against that guy, it's gonna be a bad day for America. And so I thought there was a story there uh, uh, to be told. And, uh, but the artist in me decided not to write that book, that is the first book. I wanted my soldier to, come back from overseas, fall in love, and he gets married, and then the attack occurs in the third book. Well, by the time the third, I was in, I had the manuscript for the third book. I'd won a national award for the first book I'd put out, and uh, I was doing okay. And uh, I had the manuscript, and uh, I'm driving to work to Lockheed Martin, and uh, the towers went down. And the next day, the FBI was warning agricultural areas to watch out for anybody suspicious uh, renting crop dusters um, because they could use those to attack uh, cities and such and by spraying them with poisons. I had that attack written in my manuscript. Um, I, I had the bad guys coming out of Apple Valley just north of uh, L.A., and uh, they would fly down the uh, highway US 10 and land in uh, the riverbed, dry riverbed, riverbeds and refuel uh, with poison and then fly back through across uh, Santa Monica. I realized at that moment that my years of study and vulnerabilities that I really could recognize them. And so I stopped that manuscript. I put that book away and I had to write a, a, my third book uh, which was a terrorist attack in America. I, I did a different thing and and recently returned to that concept uh, in another book called Black Camel, the fifth book in the series. Uh -huh. So yeah, I've been writing for a long time. Ah, oh, Shad. And, you know, I do, I do want to give you a, help, a heartfelt thank you for your service to us. Um, it's just, I'm so grateful beyond words. It's, Oh, really grateful. I, I, something you have on your right. website. Oh, let, let me answer yes. that. Yes. It, it, it was an honor. Okay. Oh. Uh, and I think many soldiers feel it was an honor what they did. So thank you. But it, oh. it was an honor. I, I gained a lot from taking care thank of America. You, Sorry thank to interrupt. You. No, thank you. Thank you, my dear. Gosh, uh, I would love to have you uh, share with us on your website. I saw you happy heavens day. Tell us about that. Um, I blogged about a happy heavens day card uh, after my wife passed away. And um, those of us who've uh, had someone that we truly loved um, the, the black, the black grief comes. And um, in the process, uh, I just noticed that uh, society, when that, when that you have this loss, that there's all these, um, they say it that way. Oh, it's a loss. And it's, it seems to be a very negative, um, sad sympathy cards. Okay. And I realized from some other things that happened, 
and truly believe that my wife uh, made it into heaven. She she died in my arms on her 31st wedding anniversary. Um, but afterwards, um, I came to realize that it was her heaven's day. So I wrote her a happy heaven's day card. And I really encourage people that if they've lost a loved one, it even in the blackness, if they, if you truly believe they made it to heaven because of their way they led their life and repenting your sins and that type of stuff, then be cheerful. Yeah. And uh, so I, I um, celebrate that day every year as a happy day. That is a beautiful like, person. I got to catch up. That, you know, really gives us a different direction to go at that time. I, I'm going to remember that forever. I'm going to think about happy heaven's day. Because yeah, that's, that's a beautiful perspective. Um, I love that, Ed. You, you really, you really have a great talent in seeing and understanding and, and, you know, coming up with things that can help other people. And, and you really have a great vision in, you know, all your writings and what you've done with this latest book. That is, that is something thank I, you. I want to say thank you for, Ed. Yes. Um, just as the, uh, uh, the, one of the big picture things is uh, I'm doing a half, uh, price, a uh, half price sale uh, this coming Monday and Tuesday for Centurion Witness on Amazon. Uh, if people want to pick up the book, uh, read reviews there and the synopsis, um, they can pick up the Kindle book there or they can uh, get a hold of me and go on my website, uh, books by edmitchell.com, and uh, you can order the uh, the physical book, this one right here, it's a really nice one. Um, from my uh, that be autographed, and I'll send it off to the the uh, buyers. So uh, I encourage, and you're doing it, and I appreciate it. I encourage people to give this as a gift. It's it's got a great message in it, and a positive message. Mm -hmm. um, and I I'm really pushing to try and get the book out there. I'm not really we need sales to be able to pay for more production than that in, in, in marketing but uh i really think it's a it's got a message yeah yeah beautiful message do you do you see yourself writing uh another book after this since from this i'm uh i am i uh opened my mouth and volunteered uh not with my West Point classmates, uh, class of 1970, which is our uh, motto is serve with integrity. Um, uh, we did not have our 50th anniversary because of COVID. So we're going to celebrate our 55th anniversary coming up in a couple of years. Um, that's a big time in, in a West Point class because you're starting to get a lot of a number of classmates that can't come or they're sick and, and dying. I suggested that if we could collect from our classmates lessons learned, not just from being a soldier, but whatever lessons learned across your life, mm -hmm. uh, and we put that into a, a book, it would become a excellent um, historical document, but it would become an excellent font that you could go to to find uh, advice, uh, lessons learned that the hundreds of guys have done. And it's turning out um, that that the nuggets are really coming in. So I'm head down on that. It's a multi-year uh, work, uh, more for uh, America and our class. And I won't return to fiction until after I get that one oh, done. I can't wait. Uh, could oh, I give you an example? Of one of the yes, yes. And please also one of the share lessons your uh, website address with us, please. That that's books by by uh, edmitchell.com. Thank you. Uh, but one of the lessons learned was really cool. We opened we opened the book up to family members, including the wives of the classmates, and um, 
this one gal was our classmate was a senior officer. So she was invited to uh, a party one time at Fort Lewis and he was um, overseas and they, uh, they had some three and four star generals there and they, they asked her about all this back to back uh, shipping of the soldier units overseas. How, how are they handling that from the wife's standpoint? And she said, well, one of the biggest issues is that young soldiers, guys who are married to a soldier, their wife goes off and leaves them with the kids, sometimes very, very young kids, uh, one or two year olds. And um, you have to understand that the those far those general officers, they never were in an army that had women that that came about. Um, about 1980 or so um and so they're they're they don't have that experience and uh, they were surprised and they asked her well what did you do about it and she said i talked to senior nco wives and senior officers wives and asked them if they'd be surrogate grandmothers for these soldiers so if the guy got into a jam he had to go off and do duty and he's got this small baby or two uh, couldn't didn't have any other people he could uh, call up the surrogate grandmother and many of them really enjoyed it uh, and so it was really a very creative um, uh, solution and not a lot of people I had no idea that type of problem could be solved that way so the the I'm I'm very happy at seeing some of the material that's in the book yeah. And uh, so I'm striving to do that. Oh, thank you. Oh, my gosh. We have about two minutes left. And what last words do you want to share with everyone today? <laughs> well, um, you talk about wellness and uh, that you're strong on trying to help people get there. And uh, uh, th this book is about wellness uh from a, when you've really screwed things up and you're trying to get over it. But uh, uh, I have to appreciate what you're doing to help people because I've seen it with divorce and, and things where um, you start to realize that the relationships that you have are the most valuable. Now, health is in critically important too because things can go wrong in a family and it's just hard to handle. Uh, but one of the things... Uh, that you can control is if you're calm about it and think about it is picking a good, a good partner. Um, and so um, that, what I say is for one thing, pick the smiley ones. I mean, someone I who's that. cheerful, joining up with someone that. who's down all the time, all things being equal, <laughs> yep. date the smiley one. I love that. I love that. So when we chatted earlier, uh, I just, I keep thinking about that. I think that's so awesome. Oh my gosh. Well, Ed, thank you so much. It was such a great honor and so much fun to have you on the show. Love, hugs, and blessings. Everyone out there, thank you for joining us. Check out Ed's book. It's so fantastic. And just, it's an honor to, to share my guests with you. And, and I would like to share something that I'm real excited about today. My Why Am I So Happy book just received the gold medal from the Global Book Association. So thank you. And I tell you, I you know, sharing my shows with you and my amazing guests is a reason I'm happy. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ed. Thank you, everyone. Love, hugs, and blessings. Oh.